Hi, this is Mark Birch, and today I'm going to be analysing Act 1, Scene 4 of Macbeth. When Duncan says there's no art to find the mind's construction in the face, he's basically the first character to recognise that looks can be deceiving. It foreshadows a central theme of the play, that of the hidden or the deceitful. And there are many examples of this in the play, such as Lady Macbeth's look like the innocent flower but be the serpent under it, and also Macbeth's false face must hide what the false heart doth know, amongst many others. It's also the first example that we get in uh, this particular scene that's laden with dramatic irony of dramatic irony. Uh, Duncan's explaining how he was deceived by the traitorous Fane of Cawdor at the same moment that Macbeth, the new Fane of Cawdor, walks onto the stage. So Macbeth's traitorous thoughts have already been given to the audience and we recognise that Macbeth is another potentially traitorous Cawdor. Shakespeare's at pains to present Duncan as both humble and gracious. Um, he begins by saying, O worthiest cousin, using that superlative form to demonstrate in what high regard he holds Macbeth. And he goes on to basically put himself down while elevating Macbeth. He uses this metaphor of flight in Thou art so far before that swiftest wing of recompense is slow to overtake thee, suggesting that the kind of rewards that he would like to give Macbeth for Macbeth's actions would have difficulty catching up with Macbeth because Macbeth's merits, what Macbeth has done, are so far in advance of where he can catch. It's also another example of dramatic irony given that the audience knows that Macbeth just doesn't deserve this kind of hyperbolic praise. Macbeth has already intimated to the audience that he's considering murdering Duncan. Macbeth's response to the king is basically one of you don't owe me anything but what Shakespeare's doing is drawing the audience's attention to the fact that Macbeth is fully aware of the nature of duty towards the king um, it's ironic that uh, this kind of expression of loyalty is made by Macbeth when we as an audience are fully aware that Macbeth has the murder of Duncan in his mind and will therefore undermine that duty. Duncan then turns his attention to Banquo and Shakespeare gives him a horticultural metaphor to illustrate that he intends to support Banquo's rising status as well as Macbeth's. That horticultural metaphor is then extended by Banquo in his response to show his loyalty and humility. He says, there if I grow, the harvest is your own. In other words, any fruits that uh, that kind of growth bears or offers will be Duncan's for Duncan to relish and enjoy. Now, this kind of horticultural metaphor that uh, Shakespeare's employed also reappears towards the end of the play in Act 5, Scene 2, where um, the Scottish lords are talking about the state of Scotland. Um, Lennox states, or so much as it needs to dew the sovereign flower and drown the weeds. And we'll return to that later. Duncan states that he intends to name his son Malcolm the Prince of Cumberland. Um, this would make him the heir to the throne in a similar way to today the Prince of Wales would be the heir to the throne. Um, it's not something that would happen automatically, it's not an hereditary title, so this could come as a surprise to others. Um, the king would have the right to name his heir of anyone. The other thing he goes on to do is to use a simile, uh, but signs of nobleness like stars shall shine on all deservers. Perhaps, I think, conveying the universality and beauty of Duncan's gifts. He's not just confining his largesse to his family, like his cousin Macbeth and his son Malcolm, but to all who deserve rewards. And I think that that's potentially complemented by the sibilance. If you have a look at the penultimate line there, but signs of nobleness like stars shall shine, it's really overwhelming and could perhaps convey the overwhelming nature of Duncan's generosity. Macbeth speaks in an aside, which, according to Elizabethan theatrical convention, would mean that he's speaking the truth and immediately recognises that Malcolm is now an obstacle to his ambitions. Um, that's a step on which I must fall down or else owe a leap. You know, I'm either going to be thwarted by uh, the Prince of Cumberland or I've got to get past him somehow. For it, in my way, it lies. He returns to this metaphor again later in the act in scene seven with the idea of vaulting ambition which o leaps itself and falls on the other. 
So this idea of an obstacle that must be defeated is important to Macbeth's mind because he knows that actually he really does want to achieve the role of king. We've just heard Duncan using star imagery in a really positive way. And here it is used again, but this time transformed into something to be feared. For Macbeth, the light could expose his traitorous desires. And this is an idea that's returned to later in the play many times. Uh, for example, in Act 1, Scene 5, Lady Macbeth says, Come thick night and pull thee in the dunnest smokes of hell. She wants to be hidden by the darkness. Here again, Macbeth preaches a desire for self-deception. He wishes to have killed the king, but not to kind of know his own act. Hence this metaphorical use of the eye winking or closing off sight, hiding knowledge and the hand, the bit that's doing something, not being seen. And finally, we have even more irony, uh, because it appears that Shakespeare's staged this part of the scene so that uh, Banquo has been praising Macbeth to Duncan whilst Macbeth was delivering this kind of traitorous aside, so that when Duncan returns to his dialogue, he says, true worthy Banquo, he is full so valiant, and in his commendations I am fed, it's a banquet to me. The banquet metaphor conveying the way in which Duncan regards Macbeth as somehow sustaining him. This, of course, to the audience is absurd because essentially Macbeth has just been plotting the downfall of the king. And those final words of the scene, it is a peerless kinsman, provide even more dramatic irony. Macbeth is said to have no equal, but again, the audience have just listened to those kind of murderous intentions of Macbeth. Okay, top.